Friday, March 11th. This is 7.30 p.m. Call meeting. I think we're good, Sue. I think we're good? I think okay. so. I heard the announcement. Can uh, I can I reclaim host? That's going to be a key thing. I'm not sure if that's going to work or not. You can try. You know what? Then, then you know what? Then I won't. I won't do it tonight. I should have all of my, no, I don't have all of my usual controls here in the background. Is that why I only see you? No, Michael, you only see me because I'm the one talking and you have it in speaker view. So if you wanna see everybody. Yeah. So put your mouse on the screen, go up to the top right. It'll say view, the word view with a little box beside it. Click on that and change it to gallery. Okay, I don't see the you. There's so damn many things on this desktop. Yeah, um, this, is, this is up at the top of your Zoom screen on the right-hand side at the top. There's a little box. It's got nine little boxes inside the little box. It says oh, view. Oh, yeah. I had that and it's gone now. <laughs> okay, so move your mouse on the screen, like just over every over my face. <laughs> Suddenly when okay. you've gone. <laughs> and then it, well, that's it, the... it should show up again in the top right-hand corner. Okay, in any case, in any case, we're getting started. Um, a reminder and the, uh, That's it. everybody. What did you do? Did you hit Wi Fi? Sue to shut everybody down. Do you have your and John. So at this at this point in time, Bernie, I don't have the controls to, to no do that. So if we can just ask everyone to um, mute their their mics and turn off their video at this point in time, we'll uh, get our meeting started. Thank you. Okay, so now I get to talk to myself again. Well, I get to talk to John. It's just John and I here now. That's great. Okay, welcome everybody to our March the 11th uh, members meeting of the Hamilton Amateur Astronomers. I don't know what it's doing where you are, but it's snowing here. And it's a good thing that we're inside and indoors and everybody's safe at home. I see, well, I did see faces a few minutes ago, but now I see names, some new names. Welcome. Uh, if you're a new member, welcome. You're going to really enjoy the club, I hope. But what you get out of it is up to you. We'll give you just about anything you want for uh, related to this hobby. Um, I imagine we have some guests. I see Brett Tatton here from, uh, from the uh, Blue Water Group. And I imagine there's a couple others as well. You're welcome always. My name is Bernie Vaness. I'm the chairman of this organization. Uh, I have been since, well, this is my first year in my second go round. So I don't know if you want to count that as my fourth year or first, second time. Uh, it's a pleasure to operate in this environment. We have a lot of people that help us out, and you are one of them. And you know who I'm talking about. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, it's because you're not helping. Um, one, of the, one of the many things that this club has is the Astro 101 program, which we're running currently i believe we're into our third week on it or our third session if you're not familiar with it and want to become familiar with it we can give you the information to find out more that would be with john i don't see john here uh, john govro is in charge of that operation we also have a lending library for our members uh, it's a little difficult to operate when we're in COVID restrictions, but if there's a book that you absolutely wanted to get a hold of, we could probably figure out a way to get it to you. Um, what else do we have? We have uh, an education program that you just cannot be beat, I don't think. Uh, Joanne is uh, our education director. Um, Joanne, do you have anything to let us in on? I know I'm catching you off guard, but 
No, I, I sure do actually, but maybe we should wait till after the speaker because I want to talk about our exciting contest. Okay, we will do that. So you've been warned people. I mean, you've been advised people. <laughs> um, let's see what else we have a lending program as well for new members or all members actually, but project for uh, it's best for uh, new members, especially those that don't have equipment as yet. Uh, don't go running out buying expensive stuff till you have a half an idea of what you really want. We have various types of telescopes, we have binoculars, we have different things that let you try stuff out before you go out and spend the money. And that's a good idea. Um, again, we'll get the information out to you for uh, the contacts on that as well. What else have we got here in my list of little things to talk about? Um, oh yes, yes, we also have an awards program. Uh, how could I forget that? We have a uh, couple of beginners programs. We also have uh, a Messier program. We will very soon have a lunar observing program. You're all invited to partake in those. Uh, speaking of those awards and such, if, if you find uh, another award program, whether it be in the Astronomical League in the States or the Royal Astronomical Society or the British Astronomical Association or Bob's Association of Astronomers, I don't know, I don't care. If you find an award program there and you choose to do that award program, even if you're not a member of that organization and you complete that uh, award program, submit it to me and we will see about getting you a certificate for it. <clears throat> it doesn't matter. As in fact, um, jo yes, Joanne just recently finished a certificate program with the RESC uh, regarding exoplanets. And congratulations to her for that. We like to recognize achievements. I like to recognize achievements. Anyway, Speaking of awards and such, and guest speakers, well, I wasn't speaking to speakers, but I am now. The, uh, one of the books that I have for our giveaway tonight, and I hope you can see this here. Let's see if I can get it to come up. Come on. It's, okay, you see the 50 coming up. All right. Uh, let me see it. Get rid of this. This might help. There we go. 50 things you can see with a small telescope. And if you go down here, you will see, maybe there he is, right there. John A. Reed, John Aaron Reed. John Aaron Reed is our speaker this evening. He will speak to us about his books, uh, amongst other things, a couple of observing programs. And I'm not gonna steal any more thunder of John's because I wanna hear this man talk. It's up to you and it's open to you, John. All right, Bernie. Well, I hope everyone's having a great evening. I am super happy to be here with all you guys. This is great. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. I was like, can I can I participate in the raffle? I'm not sure if I have a copy of that book anymore. <laughs> because I give you some of the backstory on, on that book. So, and it goes all the way back to when I started doing um, visual astronomy and amateur amateur astronomy in general. And that was about maybe 12 years ago or 13 years ago at this point. And, you know, so I'd started, if, if anyone read the intro to that book, it starts off with me talking about how I bought this, this telescope at the pharmacy for $14. And it was, I think a 40 millimeter, you know, F, F13 scope or something. So this really thin, really long. And it had, it didn't even have one and a quarter inch eyepieces. There were these tiny, tiny eyepieces. And I saw, I took it out, you know, I was very excited about astronomy. I'm, like, ah, I'm going to get into stargazing. Little did I know it would become my entire life after that. But I saw this yellowish star and I, I set the set up this $14 telescope. And if you know anything about the long focal lengths, the long focal lengths compensate for poor optics. So even though it was probably the telescope was probably only worth like five dollars at most, um, it could see Saturn. And that's what that little yellow star was that I saw. It was Saturn, and I was just blown away. But I couldn't see anything else with the telescope. So then I had to go and then I, I, I bought a much bigger telescope at 60 millimeters. So about that big, you know, the same aperture as like this, this little guy. 
uh, here. And, um, you know, so the rest is history. Then I started seeing the Messier objects, which we'll talk about tonight. And then I got what's called aperture fever. So aperture fever <laughs> is what happens when you realize that the, the wider um, your telescope is, the, the larger the aperture, the more you can see. And so I immediately, well, asked my wife first and Christmas was coming and we got a 12 inch Dobsonian telescope. And after I had that, then I'm like, well, now I'm brave enough um, to join the ast local astronomy club. And we were living in San Francisco at the time. And so I joined the Mount Diablo Astronomical Society. And I was like, hi, I'm new to astronomy. I don't know very much, except that I have a 12 inch Dobsonian and I've seen most of the Messe objects. And they're like, what? That's fantastic. And then so they're like, why don't you join our outreach team? <laughs> and <laughs> that's great. And I didn't have kids at the time. And I had lots of time on my hands. My day job, I was, a, I was a, a corporate accountant. So I did finance and accounting for the Clorox company, which is based out of Oakland. Could see San Francisco, San Francisco Bay from my office, then Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but I had my eyes on the stars. So what's really interesting about California is at least where, where we lived, I lived on the other side of, of the Caldecott Tunnel. Uh, if you know anything about San Francisco, very cloudy in San Francisco, you go through the tunnel, there's like no clouds. And so I was doing up to four astronomy events per week with their outreach team. And we went probably a good year one year without getting clouded out, which now that I live in Canada is like, it's pretty, pretty darn impressive because we get clouded out here more than not. And so, so I started volunteering like crazy. I put the Dobsonian on the, on the roof of my wife's car, went to so many astronomy events. I killed the car because the wind, you know, on the California freeways on this giant Dobsonian that I'd strapped to the roof, basically just killed the radiator in the car. Anyway, that's another story. Um, but I realized something that going to all these schools with, with the, um, with, with the outreach group there, which was organized by the NASA Night Sky Network, um, that a lot of these kids, and we were mostly working with high school students, a lot of them had telescopes. They'd gotten a telescope for Christmas or their birthday, and they couldn't see anything with it. They didn't have that basic set of knowledge to be able to go out and, and see anything more than the moon if they even looked at the moon. And I realized that if I gave these kids what I call the whims, they needed a goal and then they needed to accomplish that goal. Uh, if, and if they got that win, then they'd be hooked. Then they'd be into the hobby. Then they'd go get the telescope out um, of the closet and start observing. And so I realized that, you know, as I was developing, you know, what, what are we going to see tonight? You know, and, and I make okay, and I went and I come up with a list, and I realized there's really only about ten. You still hear me, okay? Yep. Yes, I yeah. hear you. So I realized there's there's only about ten awesome targets per season that were good for these kids, and so I decided to put it into a book, and there was fifty things to see with a small telescope, and I had almost written it for me, just so that I'd have a reminder when the next year came. Okay, what were those ten targets again? Um, and so I published this book, and I. I threw it up on like Lulu or some like random self-publishing site. And then I Google and they're like, nah, you can, you can actually put it right on Amazon. And so I put it on Amazon and people started buying it. And I was very confused. I'm like, why would anyone want to buy my like black and white astronomy book? And so I went and I made it a little bit better. And I, you know, had it edited. Uh, Marnie Bernardson, who actually developed the NASA Night Sky Network, she was, she became my editor and we made the book much better. And then, uh, a lot more people started buying it. And I was like, holy cow. And it, it got to the point where, um, you know, it was, it was the, this little astronomy book was covering, it was helping so many people and that people were telling their friends about it that, um, you know, it was just enough income to cover if I were to leave my job and start an astrophysics program. And sort of, I sort of did the math on this and, my wife and I made the very, I felt like easy decision at the time. That's it. John is so obsessed with astronomy. We're going back to Canada where he was born 
and we are going to you know just do strong astronomy and write stargazing books full time and that's what we did uh, we moved to Canada and my wife was like you got to write a kids version so we did 50 things to see with a telescope for kids which has been pretty much the number one astronomy book on Amazon period for the last four years um, it generally tops the charts around Christmas and then trickles out you know the further away you are from Christmas but it, it's been up there and so it's been really neat uh, and I've since I'm on my 15th book now 15th space-based book. And, um, and tonight we're going to talk about three of them that can help you in your journey in um, sort of this goal-based observing, which I found is, is the best way, you know, to get yourself motivated and to get these wins that really encourage you to pursue this, this hobby at a much more deep level. Um, yeah, so I'd like to pause for a second. Any questions? That was a crazy backstory. Any questions um, on that so far? You can leave them in the comments. I've got the comments open. I can skim through them now. Um, let me just switch it here to all participants. Let's see if that changed anything. Yeah, so goal-based observing. So we know that the RASC has uh, a number of programs like Explore the Universe, and you can get certificates if you're a member. Um, they have an explore the moon and a messier objects and find its NGCs and all these programs. And, you know, I looked at those and I was like, that's cool. And so sort of, I got my log book out and I got the observer's handbook. I'm sure, I don't know if you're a member, you get one of these from the RASC. And then, you know, they have tables for the objects. Like they have a table of the messiers. I don't have it really open right here. But what I found it really difficult, you know, using the observer's handbook, was to really get organized. So like tying what was in this to what is observable in the sky right now to what I had written sporadically in my logbook. Or, or I had, for a while I had printed out the logbook that was on their website, but I had trouble like getting, getting motivated to keep it organized so that I'd have a coherent submission for these programs. And so when I decided to write um, this book about the Messier objects, I'm like, well, what if, um, what if we can put this all on one page? So it, it takes away all the confusion of, you know, getting organized and, and knowing what's in the sky at what season. And um, so that if you're just going stargazing on any random night, you can just open the book to whatever season it is and start observing and, and, and log those observations in such a way that they'll count towards the certificate because the rules are quite strict and so what we did and here's here's 50 things to or 110 things to see with a telescope and i'll share my screen here in a second if i can but what we did is on every page um we have an observing log and this is done by by season or or by by month so autumn which would be september october november um we've got all the the messy objects that are visible at that time of the year and then an observing log, which has all the requirements to get the certificate, because it's really important. Um, and especially for the Astronomical League, if you remember there, they really require the uh, seeing and transparency for, for you to get your certificate. You can't leave that out. And so you need to understand how to uh, do seeing and transparency. And so um, what we did when we did this book is we made it really clear on sort of the page before we start observing the observing program. Uh, how to measure your seeing and your transparency because you need that. Um, and then all the notes of what, what instrument you're using, um, the date and the time and location that you need. And for RASC, you actually do need to observe every target. Um, the Astronomical League in the United States, uh, you, you only need to do 70 of the targets and then you get a, um, an honorary certificate if you, if you see all of them. And so that's that's our most recent project. I can share my screen, I think. And just share my whole, whole desktop here, I guess. Share, okay. Oop. All right, so there's the cover there. Feel free to interrupt me if, 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 this, if you can't see this. Um, yeah, here's the cover. And so here's the book again. This is done by season. We've also... We wanted to do it as well if people are doing Messier marathons. And that's where um, in March during the new moon, so I guess there was one seven days ago, and then there'll be another one near the end of the month in March. 
it's possible to see all the Messier objects, except maybe M30, uh, in one night. Uh, but you need to change the order a little bit. So we've made notes on if you're doing marathoning, here's the order you need to do uh, for that. But basically, um, you open it up to the season you're in, and you start observing. Um, and if you're doing the certificates, you're not allowed to use marathon observations toward your uh, certificate. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, oh, and when I'm screen sharing um, for the host there, um, I can't see the comments and screen share at the same time. So feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions. John, yeah. everything seems good from our end. Great. Um, yeah, so winter, for example, if you guys follow me on YouTube, and you all should if you have uh, a Google account or a YouTube account, you hit that subscribe button. We did a really good or a really, really fun uh, activity because I love trying to find original ways to make stargazing extra fun. So I borrowed an astrophysicist from St. Mary's University and I gave her um, this telescope with a camera on it and uh, controlled by an iPad and we had a race. And so our race was, could I sketch all the winter Messier objects in the same amount of time as she could image them and she had to do one minute exposures. And so it turned out to be one of the most fun videos. It's only about eight minutes long because um, we had to professionally edit it uh, and just shows you how much fun you can have, you know, if, uh, if you've got a goal and my goal was to see all, all the winter targets faster than this astrophysicist with the computer. Um, uh, and it turned out to be just just a hoot. And so I think we called that video. Actually, I've you can see my screen. I can show you here on uh, where is it here? Yeah. So it's this can a celestial on star sense be moved to another telescope? So within that video, I raced the astrophysicist um, because I put a star sense um, on my Dobsonian, which is something I pulled off a less expensive telescope. Anyway, yeah. So that's that's my YouTube channel. But back to the book. Uh, anyway, so this, this book, uh, to give you some background, I actually started this book in 2017 or 2018, I believe, and because it, I thought it was important uh, when you're stargazing, and sometimes you don't know if, if you've centered on the target. And so it was important for me to have a picture of every object on every page, but it was also important for me to have taken this picture myself. I didn't want to go on the internet um, and sort of just download pictures for this book. And so I used the telescope at St. Mary's where I worked at the time. Um, and my goal was to take all of them. And I, I think I could do all of them except for some of the ones that were really, really wide field like this. Um, and some of the ones that are, are the targets that are fairly south. So the, the Burke Cathy Observatory can only get down to about 20 degrees above the horizon. And then I rented time on a telescope in a telescope that was the same size. So I'd have the same image scale as the Burke Cathy Observatory in Arizona. Um, and got some of those lower targets. And so that was another goal. And that, that sort of slowed down the production of this book. And I also didn't quite know what the direction of the book was going to be. Um, should I make it more for kids or should it be, you know, a lot more detailed? Um, and it's sort of procrastination of doing this book. Here, I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, as I procrastinated writing this book, I actually wrote five books in, in and published five books in the meantime. So like, 50 Things to See on the Moon came out, and we'll talk about this in a second in the middle of um, writing that. My wife and I wrote Animals in Space, which won a starred review um, in one of those review programs that we have in Canada or North America, I guess. Um, and this was last year's book, 50 Things to Know About the International Space Station. And these were just a lot of fun because I got to you know reach out to astronauts and ask about all their experiments and stuff. Uh, what else we do during that time? I think we did uh, 50 things to see with a telescope, one specifically for bookstores in Canada for like chapters. Uh, we did a RASC specific workbook, astronomy workbook for their Explore the Universe program, and lots of other stuff. And so by the time that I was ready to get back to writing um, 110 things to see with a telescope here, let me pull it up again. You know, I felt, and, I, and I'd been, I've been doing astronomy outreach at St. Mary's uh, or more working at the observatory and teaching the students as part of their astronomy 1000 course um, that I hadn't actually gone out and observed these things in years. 
And so for that reason, I reached out to uh, Chris Vaughn, who is a sort of a space journalist who does a lot for space.com and stuff. And so we teamed up on, on the book and because he had recently um, gone through all the messy objects and documented his progress and stuff. And so we basically put our minds together and wrote all these descriptions of the messy objects and how we, you know, rated how difficult they were to see and made some comments on, you know, in the observing tip section, well, what, what, you know, how far away from town do you need to get so that you can see it? Uh, what magnification would be ideal? Um, and, and it was really a, a neat partnership to really, you know, um, to really get, to get the points down to make it for the reader so that they can have the highest chance of success in, in seeing these objects. Uh, and then at the, if we go to the beginning of the book, we made sure that there was a history of the Messier list, um, you know, a really quick background in, in basically the astronomy of it all. What are these objects that you're looking at? Um, and then how to plan your observations and how to, how to do, basically how to do stargazing in general. You know, if you're gonna be looking at uh, galaxies and stuff, making sure you're away from, you know how to find dark skies, knowing how to find dark skies is a skill all of its own. Knowing, becoming moon aware, knowing that those new moon nights are, or going on a night when you know the moon is gonna set soon, like in the crescent phases, um, you know, that's important. Using the dark sky maps to sort of find, find out where, where you should be observing from to see the targets. And then just some tricks about using the telescope, using a vertical vision to, uh, you know, bring out the details in the galaxy, for example. Um, uh, learning about, you know, what, what targets are up at what time of the year and all that stuff. So if you don't have a deep background in astronomy, this, and you got this book for Christmas, let's say, it's all here. Like you don't need to go outside this book to go get additional knowledge so that you can then, you know, go observing. And of course we, we deep dive into the telescopes that we recommend um, you use to do the observing, sort of the minimum telescopes. And then just a brief summary of how to, okay, here's the telescope that's in your, that's in your closet. Let's show you how to use it. And so that's included in the book as well. All right, so let's pause here for a second. Maybe I'll, I'll stop sharing here again. Just see if uh, uh, anyone has any questions. Someone's commenting, my star sense didn't spend much time on the original telescope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mine neither. So I just basically left it on there to do a YouTube review of what star sense was. If anyone doesn't know what star sense is, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a basically a mirror that clips onto your telescope and your iPhone clips into it and your iPhone constantly takes pictures of the sky and tells, basically tells the iPhone, and the, which is locked onto the telescope, where the telescope is uh, or where it's pointed. And so it allows you to really quickly go between targets just by pushing your telescope. And so I immediately um, took it off this telescope that I bought used for $100 and I put it on my 12 inch Dobsonian. And it really just worked flawlessly. I was able to just, fly through targets um, once I got to a dark sky. Um, I mean, if you were doing a Messier marathon and use star sense, um, you could go through it pretty quickly. Now, you, that said, if you're using star sense, you have to, and, and you're trying to get your certificate, you have to, uh, if it's RASC, you have to check that um, it's computer assistant. So there's a separate uh, certificate if you're using electronic assistance. Let me get some water here. Um, yeah, so if you're if you want the object to count for your Messier Messier certificate, you would have to turn Star Sense off and find it with ideally a Telrad. Um, I find finder scopes really challenging for deep sky objects. That's just me. Um, but yeah, so uh, and that's another thing about the book. The book is designed for use with a Telrad. So if we go back and share my screen share. Um, every object has a Telrad uh, bullseye that is sized um, correctly to the star map. So you basically line up the Telrad. If anyone doesn't know what a Telrad is, um, or a Rigel Quick Finder, or a Star Pointer Pro, they're basically these uh, pointing devices that sit on your telescope. You align them so that the bullseye and your telescope are pointed out exactly the same spot. Uh, and then you use them with star maps to find targets. So that's, that's what a Telrad is. Um, they also called bullseye finders. This is a Rigel quick finder. 
and Celestron makes a really nice one now too. Uh, anyway, yeah, so every page here has Telrad, Telrad rings. And then if we, you know, have, we're doing the Virgo cluster, for example, this was a really, Chris Bond and I worked on this for weeks. Let me go find it here. Um, and it sort of took four, four pages. So within the single field of view, at least Telrad field of view, your, binoc your telescope is probably a lot closer, like maybe you're using 25 magnification, which would be this ring. Um, but it's quite a few objects. So how do you identify which one is which? And so this book talks briefly about what's called galaxy hopping. And so you'll find a bright, one of the brighter galaxies in the group, maybe that's M87, and that's sort of your home base. And then after you found M87, you might bump, you know, bump the telescope up here, up north, to Mercarian's chain, or maybe we'll go over here and knock out these galaxies, and then always coming back to M87, sort of the brightest one in the bunch, just so that you're oriented. And the other thing we did in this book to try and make it easy, um, let's say I was using a refractor, I might want to actually go in here with a pencil and make a big X on this map so I know not to use it, because you want to be using that um, mirror reversed view. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, tell us, tell the type of telescope you're using determines what the view is. And it usually doesn't matter if you're just casually observing because there's no up, down, left, and right in space, really. Um, but you want to know it if you're doing an observation, an observing program, what version your telescope is. So refractors with the 90 degree diagonals, like, um, like this guy, uh, show typically show a near reversed view, um, except these ones, this is called these little ball um, diagonals here. They actually use a prism instead of a mirror, and they give you a standard view. So that corrects the um, having that that mirror image, and it actually gives you, uh, you know, it's as if you're just zooming in with your eyes. So there's no alteration in the image. And so in that case, if you're using this telescope in this setup here, for example, you would use the standard view. And we didn't rotate it 180 degrees for the Newtonian, just for, I guess, two reasons. One you can just flip the map around and then we didn't need to include an extra map. So just hold it at a different angle. But also I find a lot of time when I'm using a Newtonian or a, especially a smaller one, um, I'm leaning over it at weird angles. And so it's not really a 180 degree rotation anyway, because you have to subtract or add the angle that I'm looking in the eyepiece with as is. So, yeah. So if you're using a Newtonian uh, style telescope, it's the one with mirrors, the ones that can't see vampires coming. It's a joke that's been going around, going around the internet. Anyway, um, you would use these standard, these standard view um, ones for doing the Virgo cluster, for example. Um, yeah. And then all of, all of the little images that we have are just standard view. Yeah. All right. Um, Yes, so I'm going to pause here. Any questions on 110 things to see with a telescope or getting your Messier certificate from any of the organizations? I know, you, uh, Bernie, you have one as well that you'll, uh, for your club that does Messier, right? Yes, yes, we do. Can, can uh, you I'll tell us about the requirements for that? I'm sorry, say it again. And what are the requirements for, are there any strict strict rules for, for your club certificate with Messier? Well, the, the most uh, pertinent rule is that you find the, the uh, objects yourself. Like you can't piggyback somebody else's observation. Right, but can you use StarSense? You can, uh, we, we suggest you don't. We prefer you learn the sky uh, manually but uh, if you choose to use StarSense or any computer aided at, uh, computer aided process, then it will be noted on the certificate. Um, we have the uh, uh, divisions the same as the Astronomical League, although the Astronomical League, as you said, was uh, 60 and 110 for the regular and the uh, honorary. Ours uh, is set at 70 and 110. Cool. The reason we cut it off at the 70 is because if you decide you want to do this and you don't have a telescope, but you do have binoculars, a decent pair of binoculars, you'll get those first 70. Yeah. Yeah, binoculars in dark sky, you definitely see most of them. In, or if, what's that famous Messier book? I have it over there in the 
don't know if I can see it with these glasses. Um, the red one? The bar. Um, Steven. Yeah. Anyway, Omira. Yeah, Steven. Steve O'Meara, he he claims to be able to see pretty much all of them with binoculars, but he's I think he has a house on a cliff in Hawaii or something. Well, uh, quite a few years ago, uh, we did a uh, Messier marathon, and uh, I did it with uh, with a fellow, and I did mine using fifteen by seventy binoculars, and I counted one hundred and one. That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty darn good. Yeah. Um, all right, I had a pair of those binoculars, but I could I, they weren't collimated, so I, I gave them away. Um, <laughs> all right, so let's- There, there is here. a question. There is a question that you missed earlier. Uh, was somebody asking where they can acquire your books? Yeah, so most of the books are, you could just, if you wanted to, you go to chapters. For me as an author, um, as much as some people don't like Amazon, Amazon does provide the highest royalties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's also it is also where most people get their books. And the best thing you can do for an author is if you do get the book on Amazon, is write is write a five star review. Um, four star reviews are actually not good reviews on Amazon, uh, not for authors anyway. Just how the algorithm works. Um, yeah, so definitely Amazon. Amazon is the best for me, um, just how it is. But if you have a bookstore, they can either order it or a lot of the bookstores carry my books in stock um because they, they order them on on their ingram internal database and and get them from there or right because most of my books are with format publishing um basically all the books except for uh all the newer books except for 110 things to see with the telescope is with them so they're all on they're the, all, you know, sorry the link to the amazon site to buy your book is in the chat yeah it's although that's the small telescope book that um that was my, that was just my very first book. I definitely recommend if someone can drop a link in for 110 things to see with a telescope. Um, we'll have, we'll have Doug do that. Doug yeah, will do that, that in the background for us. That is the one I definitely recommend right now to, um, to adult, adult beginners. And then there would be 50 things to see with a telescope without the small. And that would be for your regular observing. Although people, people do love, they love the, the small telescope book because it sort of fits, fits in your pocket, big pocket. Um, yeah, so let's talk for a second about observing the moon. Maybe I'll share my screen again. Uh, desktop one, share here. Let's flip over to, yeah, so um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dave Chapman. He's on the RASC observing committee, but he had this idea. Well, why don't you did 50 things to see with a telescope? He is obsessed with the moon. He calls himself a lunatic um, in a good way. Uh, and so we got together or, or I'm like, yes, this is, this is a great idea. And I pitched it to the publisher and the publisher is like, this has never been done before. Amazing. And so I went like crazy. I wrote as much as I could. I did a whole bunch of research and I scheduled a meeting for, with Dave, like three weeks out at a pub. And, um, I had done so much research in that three weeks that Dave was like, what do you need me for? But then we worked, we worked together and we basically put this book together with, with our, fa our 50 favorite lunar targets and here they all are. Um, but again, in terms of goal-based observing, we structured it day by day. So hypothetically, whatever day that you go observing the moon and you see the moon, you just match it to the current day in the book. Um, you know, I, I think of the, the moon as having a 14 day cycle. I, I tend not to like the star days in the morning. So 14 evening days that you can you can see the moon um and you know we so we basically have uh you know about three pages uh per per day and that that's three pages that are where the targets are within a few degrees of the terminator so the terminator is the line between night and day on the moon and i know this is 50 things to see on the moon but it's more like 50 pages of awesome stuff to see on the moon because if we look at uh, target number three, for example, is the Gang of Four, um, which are four rather large craters that are some of the first pronounced craters to appear as, as the lunar cycle begins right after the new moon. Um, and the other thing we did with this book is for every page, because it's important to get your orientation right when you're observing the moon, uh, we you know, have an, uh, 
a chart for binoculars or for the standard view, like if you're using this telescope with the erecting eyepiece, uh, and then a view as if you're looking at, at the moon with a Newtonian telescope and then a refractor telescope with a diagonal that is giving you that near reversed image. Um, and the idea here is that after you've seen it, you put a check mark and that way you can track your progress and you know you get to the book and you can tell if you've seen them all. And for the RASC Explore the Moon program, there's no requirement to sketch the target. And so as long as you've recorded the date of your observation and the fact that you saw it and what telescope you were using, um, that qualifies. So if you wanted to use this book to knock off most of the targets for RASC's Explore the Moon pr program, and it has about 70% of the targets are here, you basically could just put a check mark here and at the end of the book, just in the, in the blank white pages, write the, the date and what telescope you're using. Um, and I think I completed Explore the Moon after nine sessions is what it took me to get all the, the certificates. Um, and again, I like, I like to try and make, um, make my lunar observing or observing in general as fun as possible. So we came up with all these cool nicknames uh, for the craters. And it's funny, so on my YouTube channel, I frequently do these um, live streams where I just go and I point the telescope at the moon and then I just, people join in and I answer questions. And sometimes I'll just stay on there for like an hour or two hours and just the questions just don't stop. But I don't have the names of the craters memorized, but I do have all my nicknames memorized for the craters. So a couple of days ago on Tuesday night, for example, we looked at the, the clock hands and I was using a 12 inch Dubsonian so we could really get in there close. And you could watch the, the Tuesday night one if you just go to my YouTube channel, uh, it's, it's up there. Um, Pierce and Picard, I remember, uh, the Picard crater is, you know, French astronomer who is Captain Picard from Star Trek. Star Trek is named after. And uh, and yeah, so definitely a really, really goal-oriented way to, you know, learn your way around the moon. It just basically, if I were to do this again, and I actually do this frequently, is just get excited when the new moon comes up and then, you know, just go through all the targets. Uh, you know, they become almost old friends uh, as, as you get to know them. And it's fun pointing out the... Uh, you know, the Taurus Mountains and, and uh, all the lunar lander sites. Of course, you can't see the lunar lander. Um, you're not going to see anything smaller than about a mile in diameter. Uh, so that's Explore the Moon. And definitely a fun project. This, this book um, is, is one of the reasons that that, I, that RAS gave me the Simon Newcomb Award in 2020. Um, it was just really well received. And Celestron picked it up. And for the, the 50th anniversary of Apollo, uh, Apollo 11, they, they packaged it with all their beginner telescopes. So a lot of people got uh, this book that way. Um, so it's definitely been well-received and is a well-loved book. We've got schedules for the eclipses and, and everything in here as well. So that is 50 things to see on the moon. Um, I would actually love to do a version of this that actually has the extra 30 targets just labeled and that way you could use this entirely to get those certificates. Um, uh, some of the challenges are so, some of the more obscure craters are actually quite small. Um, they wanted to include some of the craters named after Canadians like Newcomb, uh, which is over here. Um, yeah, so quite a small crater, a little bit of a challenge. So maybe I'll, I'll close my share here so I can see if there's any, any questions here. Any questions on lunar observing? And so for this one, I when I did the program, I, I, I was doing RASC's Explore the Moon show at the same time. And so what I did is I picked up a really small telescope, so a 70 millimeter um, Celestron that was on an EQ mount, a really poor EQ mount. Uh, and I did the whole observing program uh, with that telescope just so I could uh, sort of relate to what people are going through if they're new to astronomy. It was kind of a, an interesting experience. All right, so that is Explore the Moon. How are we doing on time? I think I have about 10 minutes left here. Yep. Okay. Now let's talk about a book that I'm really excited about. Let me share my screen here again. And this is one for people that are really new to astronomy. And I know I'm calling it learn. Yeah, so this is learn to stargaze. And I added kids just because a lot of people 
a lot of adults buy kids books for themselves in regards to astronomy because I feel like the books, a lot of the books targeted at adults for beginners are, there's a lot, there's way too much going on in them. And so I want to let people know that, yeah, this is accessible, an accessible amount of information uh, for anyone. And um, it's not surprising to me that the kids book, 50 Things to See with a Telescope, kids that we did shortly after I left my job at Clorox is still my most successful book. It's just because it's, these books targeted at kids, but have all the information that adults need tend to be, you know, they tend to be really popular. Uh, and what was neat about this is I hired this, I found this artist on YouTube who was drawing constellations and he was doing them in black and white. And almost all the constellations you find images are in black and white. And I said, well, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do a kid's book and have them in color? Um, I'll get this. And so we hired sure we this are. artist to do okay, all the constellations in color. Oh, did someone have a question? No, John, I just oh. had to mute someone who just came in. It's okay. Oh, no worries. But there is a question in, in the chat. Do you want me to read it now while I'm here anyway? Yeah, absolutely. All right, give me one second here. We'll so here. this is from Doug Curry. I have 14 millimeter for eyes and 50 millimeter main aperture nine to zoom 27 times magnification binoculars. How small a feature could I see with them on the moon? <laughs> yeah, let me, 14 millimeter, is he talking about 14 millimeter, is that, does he mean inches? Like a 14 inch telescope? No, it's, it's binoculars. What was, what were the specs on the binocular again? 14 at the eye end and 50 at the other end with okay i mean 14 by 50s yeah yeah so res resolution on the moon or resolution with a telescope in general is only dependent on the aperture so nothing else in terms of res resolution nothing else matters um and so there's a bit of math you can do and if you look i did a video where i reviewed a 70 millimeter telescope on my uh my YouTube channel. I think it's if we go down here to my oh I'm not sharing. Oh I am sharing. Okay. Uh if you guys open, let me see it. I think it, yeah, Astro Master 70. In this video, I do the math on that. And because it's quite it's quite a big calculation. It takes about 10 minutes. Um but I determined and I think I'm doing this from memory that with the 70 millimeter telescope 2.7 kilometers was the smallest detail you could see on the moon. And then I think my larger telescope was 1.9 kilometers. So if your binoculars are 50 millimeters, so just 2.7, add 30, 40% to that. Um, so your, your smallest object that is possible to resolve would be about five kilometers um, you know, given the laws of physics, that's the smallest. Even if you put a fancy camera on your binoculars, that would be your limit. It would be something five kilometers in size. So basically you're gonna see, that's a, a mountain basically. And, or, you know, the reason you wanna look at things on the moon at the Terminator is because you get these long shadows. So the shadows are longer than the mountains and craters themselves. And that's what makes the features really pop out. Um, around you know looking at that line between night and day on the moon and even with binoculars it's that's the place to sort of concentrate if you're doing like rask's binocular lunar observing binocular program which i think has 20 targets or something so i hope that answers that that question well um, and, and then of course and then of course uh, atmospherics come into play on all that as well yeah yeah that math assumes basically you're in you're in a vacuum <laughs> yeah uh, it's just based on the wavelength of light. So like hypothetically, if the moon was made of x-rays or something, then you could see a lot more detail because x-rays have a much smaller smaller wavelength. Yeah, but I, I don't want to be out in the field wearing a lead apron, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're lucky that the moon is not a neutron star. Yes. <laughs> uh, although they're about the same size, but we're lucky the moon is a moon and not a neutron star, so we're safe. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll take our low resolution and, and keep our, you know, not will keep keep us alive um yeah so again with with goal-based observing let me close the chat here so i can see um at the bottom of every page 
we've got uh, a checklist here. So going constellation by constellation, um, if you're doing, let's say, RASC's Explore the Universe program or other you know, basic uh, programs for Explore the Universe with RASC, you actually don't need to be a member. It's kind of cool. You just let them know that you, you've met their criteria. Um, and they'll give you give you your certificate. And so, and again, you don't have to sketch it or anything. You just have to log that you've seen it. So basically for that, you just need the date and we put a date box here and a check mark. So, hey, I've seen Orion. I've seen Beetlejuice, which is the big, uh, you know, red, red star up here. I've seen Rigel, so sort of blue white star down here and a deep sky uh, object, the Orion Nebula. And I put little binocular symbols. Um, now this is a no telescope required book. So for the most part, um, I've made sure that nothing in here requires telescope. Binoculars just enhance these objects or allow you to see them from slightly um, light, light polluted skies. Now, of course, most people know you can actually see the Orion Nebula here in Orion without a telescope. It appears as this fuzzy star uh, in Orion's sort of sword area. Um, yeah, so basically we go through all of the popular constellations about 36 of them, I believe, of the 88 uh, in total. And um, and the brightest star in each one is usually a target in, in RASC's certificate program, at least. So for example, Virgo, your, your bright star would be Spica here. Um, and again, this book is not out yet. So hopefully I'm trying to get it out by this summer. My wife is, uh, see, we're still waiting on artwork for these, for the summer targets here. Go down to... Um, the circumpolar targets. So circumpolar targets for us are targets that don't, uh, they're up all year and all night. They just sort of circle around the, the North Star as the Earth turns. Oh, that label's off. And uh, yeah, lots of cool targets. Kemble's Cascade is a great one. I think you do need uh, binoculars for Kemble's Cascade, but it's pretty easy to find in Camelopardalis there. Um, and if you're south of the equator, equator of course. Um, and this book has information on viewing meteor showers, aurora, how to see comets. This was a fun picture I took. I was surrounded by students taking this picture, cheering me on, taking a picture of a comet there in 2013. How to see satellites, you know, what are conjunctions, what are occultations? And then we added all about the solar system because it's a kid's book. You got a tour of the solar system in a kid's book. Um, and this is the only exception to my no telescopes required because, you know, some people I feel like think that, you know, you'll get one of those, those scam emails that says that Mars will be bigger than the moon. It's like, no, we, we want to train that out of kids. So, you know, don't fall for that. Even through a powerful backyard telescope, Mars is only going to look like a, you know, a little disc with maybe some discoloration. And so that's the goal with this book is, you know, goal oriented observing for kids and adults, whoever picks this up uh, and to really get an understanding of what, what stargazing and moon gazing is all about. So yeah, really looking forward to, uh, to getting this book published here. Hopefully Formac picks it up. If not, I will publish it myself with my own company, but uh, keep an eye out for this. And definitely if you pick it up, uh, write a review because authors need reviews. That's how Amazon chooses which books to show to people. Uh, when you search things, they use the reviews. Uh, what was this? Okay, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so this this was the, um, the 50 things to see with a telescope, not the small telescope version. So this is the one we did for bookstores in Canada, which is, which is really pretty. Um, and so you basically have 10 targets per season, plus uh, the moon and um, planets. This is just a sample of the book. So you get an idea, uh, same idea here in this book where um, I showed what it would look like through a telescope under ideal conditions and a star map on every page with a recognizable constellation so that you can easily find your target. Uh, yeah, so any questions on the new book? learn to stargaze kids or what it's like to be a space author in general. It's kind of a unique, uh, I feel like there's not too many of us. It's like me and Terrence Dickinson in terms of full-time space, space authors, but yeah. So I'll stop sharing here and Bernie, do you have any questions?
How's that for goal or goal oriented observing? I think that's uh, very, very good. Very, very good. I, I'm impressed. Um, I, I will comment that the uh, the book that you were suggesting that people use for the uh, explore the universe. Uh, I just I just recently completed that program myself just for shiggles. And uh, when I sent it in, I sent in the basic information that they wanted, but it came back that they wanted a lot more information. Oh no. Yes. What did they want more than, you know, because when they, they give you basically just a checklist with, yes, the, you know, checklist. you download the PDF exactly. and you they check the boxes. Just, they wanted descriptions and they wanted the log book and this and that and the other thing. And it took me, it, it took me two weeks, as you said, it's a very quick program to do. It took me two weeks yeah. to do the program and it took me three weeks to get the award. That's too get bad. Them to accept it as, a, as the award. But that's okay, because I don't mind that, because I already had the, uh, the note taking and such. And uh, uh, I, I belong to RASC at a national level, so yep. I, I don't go through the local. And so I, I sent it out to the national, and uh, he, he sent back at one point that he wanted, to, if he could, he could, if he could see my log. Well, I keep my log book electronically now. So I said, okay, sure. So I sent it to him and, and it came back, his message came back right away. He says, holy cow. Well, I, I had sent him uh, almost 35 years worth of <laughs> log book. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, like 1800 lines of, of information and stuff. He says, you're a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the idea is though that kids can do Explore the Universe or they should yes. be able to do it. Yes. I think the challenge with Explore the Universe is the, the double stars um because i find there's a big disconnect the explore the universe starts off with i find the constellations and find the brightest star in the constellation and then you know in the moon it's there's like seven c seven objects on the moon or whatever uh five lunar seas five craters but then it's like well now you need to do 10 of 20 double stars and that i think is a sticking point for a lot of people uh, double stars are one of my favorite uh targets so i i've done i have like Five different awards for double stars. Oh wow, impressive! But yeah. yes, uh, any of these books, uh, I will I will mention to the group here. If anybody purchases one of these books and uses it as their guide, or uses it and completes their observing program in that, I will accept those as having been completed. So uh, now the thing, of course, is don't send me your book because you're going to want to keep your book. <laughs> so be prepared to photocopy it or just write out the information, but that's for another time. Um, let's see. I don't see. Oh, okay, there's a question for you from Matthew. Are you considering a book of objects beyond Messier, e.g. the bright NGCs? Yeah, so the next book that I plan to do, um, at least because, again, th this book was a five year process for me. Um, it's it started with photographing them because uh, I, I had with a bunch of log books that I had you know that were scattered all over my house I had probably observed most of the messiers before and so it was a matter of getting sort of my messier life together <laughs> try to make a pun there anyway um, uh -huh. yeah so the next one for me is is Caldwell um, the Caldwell catalog which is sort of like the next best 110 things and um and but i just i just need to go and and see them all for one is my next step and then uh just have detailed notes about it so that i can actually go and then turn that into a book mm -hmm. and so however many years that takes me is however many years it will be to get to that book um so my big project right now is again just getting this uh learn to stargaze kids out and um and so we'll that that's taken up most of my time right now. And then focusing on the YouTube channel, which is all about, um, well, I'm trying to find the channel's voice and that voice I hope is how do we maximize the fun that we can have with a telescope and with observing these targets. So, and definitely go watch that. Uh, the, the video on star sense, I think is our funnest one is our most fun video where I race the astrophysicist. And then the one um, that, that we just posted posted newbie versus pro where I, I dressed up like I used to dress when I was an accountant. And then I reused some special effects and I interview myself 
uh, in the past and tell myself how to use a, a Dobsonian telescope. Um, so that's the sort of projects I'm working on going forward uh, as well. So. Well, we look forward to those. I'd say it's uh, always good to find a new way of looking at things. And uh, as you know, I, I'm in the process of writing and offering various award programs for this club. And I have uh, curated some of your information, not a lot, some. But I, I inspired by some of the things that you've done, which is great. I, and I thoroughly enjoy your YouTube uh, channels. Oh, thanks. As well. I highly recommend your books. And I don't know, I don't see any other uh, questions here. Anybody else? Any questions for John before we uh, move to the next part of the meeting? Yeah, I think most, so I've only been observing seriously for about 12 years. I think, uh, um, how, what's the average uh, observer like at, at your club? Oh, well, we have pockets. Cause we have you, pockets of them. Yeah. We have, we have a pocket of people that are new up to two years. And then we have another group that seems to be five years to 15 years. And then the group that I'm in, which is 25 years to forever. Um, I think that's generally the demographic. And it, it's, it's interesting because we have people that are 30 years in who have never done the Messiers. Right. People that are three years in who have only done the Messiers. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. So I don't think age is such a big factor in this, or longevity, I should say, not age. Yeah, and, and people get caught up in different things. Like I haven't been able to do any deep sky because I've been working at the observatory, which is downtown. And even with, um, you know, a 24 inch, you know, plane wave CDK telescope in the city, binoculars are better at galaxies or a binoculars in a dark sky are better than a million dollar telescope in the city. Like light pollution is your biggest factor in terms of limiting what you can see for extended objects. Absolutely. Um, no, no argument at all. Yeah. No argument at all. I always thought, I've always thought that, and here might be a working title for you. Where did the sky go? Yes. Yeah. And they just put, there's this new um, condominium complex in Halifax here and they're, they're showing off their beams of light that go up into the sky to let everyone know that this is the best condo. And we're just like, oh, <laughs> really? Who let that, who approved that? Well, what we need is for China or Japan or Korea or whoever it was to get their great big space mirror up into <laughs> space and then swing it over past, uh, past Halifax and just reflect the beam back down on the building. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. You know, no, no, the same no thing one will be able to sleep at night in the, the same building. thing you want to do with, with people when they run with high beams behind you when you're driving. You want to turn that mirror and fire it back at them. But that's, that's no, don't do that, people. That's not legal. It's, it's very unsafe to do that. No, just join your, uh, there's a lot of night sky, uh, dark sky organizations. We have them here in Nova Scotia and just make sure they get your support. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll hang on for a little bit. I'll put myself on mute. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll listen in. Then I got to go rescue my kids. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Okay. Right. Um, Thank you. Sue, you wanted a minute or two to speak to us? Yes, I, I did want a minute or two. In fact, there's, there's two of us who are going to talk. So just give me a second here and I'm going to share my screen. Oh, okay. Okay, give me one second. Andromeda Meadow, yes. There we go. Okay. So um, tonight uh, we have uh, a stargazing opportunity to present to you that um, is in the works. And um, if you noticed in the last EH, there was a little save the dates 
um, in September, and that's relating to um, our HAA first ever dark sky dark sky star party from <laughs> September 23rd to Sunday to September 25th at Andromeda Meadow, which is outside of Wyerton. This property belongs to Dave Skelton, and he wants to talk about his property and the event for a minute, and then I will give you um, the pertinent details that you need to know. So Dave, it's your there. turn. Yeah, okay. Sue and my wife, Joan, met several years ago when they presented a summer camp at this uh, Falk Observatory, and that's how the, the connection was made. Um, the opportunity to have the Hamilton group up at M31 came before Joan passed away last year. So this was her idea, and um, Bruce, my eldest son, with Sue, are pleased to invite your group to a dark sky weekend, which was mentioned. So if I thought, I'm not going to go into the details because Sue has all that. So if there are any questions uh, along the, the path here, just contact Sue or uh, apparently Matthew and Bernie are in on it too. She will, uh, Sue will have all the details. Anything that we know, she'll know. Uh, and she'll keep, keep me up to date. Um, if there's any things she doesn't know, she'll contact Bruce or myself and we'll find you the answer. So with that, I, I don't want to do too much more because it's your, uh, your floor now, Sue. Hey, thanks, Dave. So you're looking at a picture of Andromeda Meadow or M31 for short. This is Dave's um, property outside of Wyerton, Ontario. Um, it is um, a beautiful piece of property with really nice dark skies. And there is a small observatory here on the right um, that has a pier with a telescope in it. So our invitation, these are the pertinent things that you need to know. So Friday, September 23rd to Sunday, September 25th with a possible extension into Monday is the weekend for the um, event. If it pours rain, it pours rain. If it has, if we have other COVID restrictions, then obviously we would have to cancel the event. But right now, we're hoping for a beautiful, sunny um, fall weekend and um, where we can do this. The property has a border scale of approximately three. And so those are very dark skies. For those of you not sure about the border scale, they are beautiful dark skies with lots and lots of background stars available. There is limited trailer and ground camping sites available on site. Um, at this point in time, we're in the beginning stages of figuring out just how many we can accommodate on site and that information will be forthcoming. For those of you who may not want to ground camp or don't have a trailer, um, the Wyerton area has many motels, B&Bs, cottages, Airbnbs, trailer accommodations in the area. So there's lots of alternate accommodations available not too far from the site. There will be a small cost associated with this, mainly to cover the cost of porta potties for the site. I have arranged with the help from um, Dave two observatory tours for the Saturday um, that are close by to their um, to his property. Saturday, we're planning a potluck supper. There are hiking trails on site with close access to the main and side wrist trails. And there's also excellent ice cream in Bay, which is a very short drive Bay. And this area of the Bruce Peninsula has also lots of other interesting activities. Um, for you to engage in. All right, need to know. There is no water on site. There is a well with a hand pump, but the water is not potable. So if you plan to stay on site, you must bring your own water with you. There is no electricity on site either. So um, we may have some generators available. That's again, something we're in the planning stages of looking at, but they, we can't guarantee that we'll have generators. 
to um, recharge um, astronomy equipment. There are no picnic tables or shelters. This is an open field. So there's no picnic tables or shelters. There are no trailer pads for putting your trailer on. You're putting your trailer right on the, the ground. So you need to be aware of the leveling aspects of that. There is also a dump station for trailers on site. So campers and all participants um, must be self-sufficient. We will have porta potties available though, for sure. I'm not going in the woods, so we're going to have porta potties available there for us. And registration is open to HAA members only. I know there are some BAS members here as well. We want to make sure that the camping on site is open to HAA members um, only um, because this is a weekend for us to get out of the city and head north. Uh, the registrations, we hope to open them in April and we will announce that at our next general meeting on April 8th. The registration will be online and it will be available through our website and the payment will be through PayPal. And if for any reason the event, um, if there's a COVID restriction again and we have, have to cancel, then we will refund the money. Um, registrations will be taken on a first come first serve basis and there'll be a limited number. Again, we are working on just what that number will be. We'll create a waiting list if required. And for more information, here is the email address where you can contact me and I will try and answer your questions to the best of my ability at this point in time. So as I said, um, Matthew Mannering and myself are the two that are heading um, this up. I mean, my husband, Doug, is as well, um, but Matthew and I are the two uh, that are kind of leading this charge to head up north. And um, we will be giving more information and we will send more information out um, in email blasts when we have that. So I see that there are questions in the chat and when I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing and I know there will be questions. So I'm gonna pop out of here and I'm gonna head back to the chat so that I can see it. If there's anything there. Can I make uh, one comment? Yes, Dave. Yeah, uh, regarding the water, it's it's a steel pump. The, the water is drinkable, but it's rusty. Like I wouldn't drink it, but it's not poisonous. Okay. That's the, okay. Like like you can you can wash your hands in it and stuff like that, um, and wash uh, wash dishes and things like that. But it's not. I wouldn't drink it. But it is, it is okay. Okay, thank you for, okay. for clarifying that. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions for Dave or I at this point in time? I'm sure you'll get lots of questions as the time comes closer. So this is, this is um, a wonderful opportunity for us here in the city. Um, Dave has very, very generously offered his property for us to use. And um, we're working on making it a very fun weekend um, for people to come up. It's about a four hour drive from Hamilton, four hour ish, depending on how fast you drive up Highway 6. Um, <laughs> and so it's about, it's about that that time away. Oh, Doug says three hours tops, but that's if Doug drives. If I drive, it's a little longer than three hours tops. So very excited about this event and um, we will share more information um, with you as the time comes. And I know we're doing this early, but I know people's plans um, book up early. So hopefully some of you will be able to take advantage of this. And I'm just going to share my screen one more time so that you can see the um, address. Whoops, wrong one. There we go. That's the one I want. Um, so it's star party at amateurastronomy.org. So if you have questions or you think of questions, you can contact me through that email.
Okay. Good, if good. I don't have any other questions, um, Bernie, back oh, to you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. So now before the break, we'll have a little chit chat from Joanne. Joanne has some very interesting news for us. Joanne, where are you? Um, you're here somewhere. There you are. Hi there. There I am. Hi. How are you today? I'm, I'm good. I'm going to share my screen and tell you about an exciting contest for younger astronomers who don't necessarily have to be members of the HAA. So if you have any young astronomers in your life, uh, feel free to pass this along to them. So this is a contest for amateur astronomers that are five to 12 years of age, and they can submit an entry for their chance to win a prize. And what they need to do is sketch a picture of their favorite constellation, um, tell us why it's their favorite, tell us a story about it, and then after looking at the night sky, create their own asterism, draw a sketch about it and tell us about it. And to learn more about what asterisms and constellations are, they can read um, this month's HAA Explorer article for more of that information. So the winning entry will be selected by random draw. And um, if the, if the um, person that submits their entry is willing, we can maybe even feature it in an upcoming newsletter. So that'll just depend on the person who submits it. And the winner will receive an astronomy related prize. So all people need to do is submit their entry by March 26th to education at amateurastronomy.org. So it's that simple. And it's a great way to get younger astronomers interested, just like John was saying. Um, and his books actually would be really good too for young people to see what the different constellations are in the sky and to sketch their favorite. So yeah, so we're gonna do that this month. And if there's any questions, just feel free to put them in the chat or send me an email at education at amateurastronomy.org. So thanks, Bernie. Oh, thank you. Thank you for putting this all together. I know it's a, it's a, it's a labor from the heart. Well, thank you for the prize. <laughs> well, that too, you're very welcome. Um, okay, let's see. That brings us up to break time. We get, everybody gets a, a, a short little break. Uh, we're running a little bit long, but we're okay. Well, how about we take uh, about seven minutes? That's about long enough to boil a cup of coffee or make a cup of tea. And we'll be back at 5 2. How's that sound? Talk amongst yourselves, but we'll be back at 5. I'll be back at 5 2. How's that? Okay. Thanks, Dave. So Chris, you've been doing anything with that adapter I made up? Question. All right. Nothing, nothing yet. Nothing no, yet? Nothing yet. It's been too cold, too wet, too miserable. So I know. I used it in the house and <laughs> it kind of went to where I think it should go. And it, it, I mean, I, Electronically, it seems to work fine. Okay. So it'll just be a matter of, uh, you know, seeing how it works. But I think it's definitely, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Dan has made a module that will basically replace the hand controller on my, my Celestron scope, where I now hook it to my tablet and use um, Celestron Sky Safari. So it's a lot easier than if you don't know the name of a star, you can just kind of look and touch it on your on your tablet, and it will help you polar line. And then 
help you use the a little bit better, easier go to than trying to scroll through all the buttons and things on your little hand controller. This now, if anybody's familiar with Sky Safari out there, it's top on your screen and away you go. Life has been, it does seem to want to make life a lot easier. And as my scope, my Anne will know the mount, it's a great mount. It's a little older, so it's not Wi-Fi. So Dan was able to invent something to plug into where your hand controller would go, and then it just connects to your to a tablet. And then you download Sky Safari slash runs um, program to your tablet. I did invent it. I've been on uh, uh, Starry Nights with some people. A guy from Ottawa actually is the one who's putting it all together. But he's put it there so you can log in and you can put it together yourself. There's that one. And there's the other one for CPIW or WI. And it will turn your Celestron scope into a, a USB port scope. So you can direct wire from your laptop directly into your scope without using your hand controller. And you can still use your hand controller if you want to uh, fine tune it here and there. Oh, that's interesting. And I like the tablets. Like you saw in the little picture, I picked up a, um, for those again, I picked up a holder that will hold the tablet and mount on a camera tripod. So it makes it quite simple to just have the, the tablet sitting on a tripod right beside the scope. And like I say, then you just take your finger and touch what you want and slide it around on the screen and it's just top and go. So like I said, worked wonderful in the back porch, seemed to go everything where it should. Now we just need to get out and uh, I don't see why it's not going to work because it did move and, you know, when I told it to go to a star or I told it to go to, um, you know, a planet, it moved and I kind of looked and went, okay, yeah, that's where the planet should be because I will admit I was cheating and using it in daytime, but it's just been too cold and miserable to stand outside and play with a new toy. So I'm waiting for a warmer night. I was just going to say, not like my wonderful wife who has been out in the backyard with her dog in freezing cold weather to... Uh, Continue on her Messier list. <laughs> How is Denise doing on her Messier list? I say she's doing wonderful. I say she's doing awesome. I should see the the uh, the book she has created with all her notes is is awesome. In fact, I think I keep teasing her that she should publish it. And then I see this gentleman tonight has published his book, and boy, they look awful awful similar to the same. And we'd never she'd never heard of his book, but yeah, no, she's she's got uh, she's been out there. Banging away at it. Good. Dogs don't quite understand why they're not allowed outside in the backyard to play with her while she's trying to look through a scope. But uh, as somebody alluded to there, they're not quite as big as horses, but they give a small <laughs> Shetland pony a run for their money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, know, I know your dogs. Yeah. I know your dogs. So, so Denise, what's your count up to? Uh, she's not here at the moment. Oh, okay. She's making tea. Um, I think she's up to about 65 or 70. Oh, good, good. Yeah, there's a couple she'd like to relook at just to clarify her notes because in early days she wasn't as detailed note keeping as she is now. Yeah, that's 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 one of the reasons for taking notes is uh, it one it slows you down when you're observing because you have to write about an object and you stick your your eye back and you look again and you see something else and you write, go right back down and you write something else down and you write something else down. But in the very beginning, when you start, you know, you, you look at, say, M5, and you, you, you say, okay, it's just a furry little blob. That's usually the first observation note you make of something uh, as a globular. Uh, and then as you come back around about a year later, you look at it again, and you look at your notes, and you go, well, that doesn't tell me anything. So now you're going to write a little bit more. So. And, and then as you go on and on and on, you develop more skills, not just in describing stuff, but in seeing stuff. They're all fuzzy little blobs to me. Yeah. I don't know how you guys see them. I, I mean, every time I see them and she points one out in the telescope, I, yeah, let me look at the tablet first. Oh, that's what it looks like? Oh, okay. Yeah, now I see it. Yeah, but well. if I had to find it on my own, nah, ain't happening. <laughs> but I mean, that's the big thing with Denise too. Every one of the messages that she's found is scar hopping. She's not used any electronic devices to help her find it. Unlike me, who was just talking about the electronic device I'm planning to use this summer. Well, that's that's all the better for her. Yeah, I think so. 
I'm very pleased with it that she's done it, like I say, without any. And it was interesting to hear that gentleman say that the Rask Messier has a box to tick off whether it was electronically helped or whether you did it on your own. Yep. Because, yeah, because she can honestly, truly say she has found it. Well, I'm, I'm didn't have a computer to kind of take her to that spot. She's had to sky hop around and, and get to the exact spot. Well, I hope and then zoom in. I hope that when she gets to her 70th and completes her 70th Messier object that she submits for the award. I really hope so. I know she's been working at it a long time. Mm -hmm. Anyway. I uh, want to mention something here. Um, I have a Celestian uh, next to our 4SE. Oh, uh, I am a new member of the club, of course. And uh, I find that um, when I bought the telescope, a lot of vibration. I was off my driveway, of course, in front of my house in West Mountain. But I bought these pads on Amazon, and it really helped a lot get rid of the vibration. Have you ever heard of anybody using that? Yes, the uh, the vibration suppression pads, the little black round things with orange circles. That's correct. Yes, yeah. 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 Those, those are pretty good. Um, they're they're very good somewhere like if you're on a dock or something or on on a deck. Uh, I have it on a deck too as well. I I actually get better results on a deck because the road. I think there's a lot of vibration from. Uh, uh, well, and traffic. Now, normally, I do my sightings at night, but I find at the back of my at the deck is a lot more uh, more stable. Right. Yeah. I think I think one of the issues you might be having, having read your information earlier, is uh, just the the uh, the fact that the tripod itself is fairly light, uh, and you get a lot of motion from that. It's not it's not mm -hmm. heavy. So what I would suggest is you get yourself uh, a coat hanger or a hook or an S hook or something, you attach it to the center uh, point of the telescope and hang mm -hmm. a bag of dirt or something on it just to weigh it down a bit. And that'll suppress the vibration coming up the, uh, coming up the legs as well. Yeah, I, I noticed that. As, as, uh, I was thinking about doing that idea myself, actually using an S hook and some weights. Cause I've heard of that before uh, as being used but um, yeah, I'm gonna give that a try. Yeah, yeah, give that a try. See mm -hmm. if that helps you. Wouldn't being on the ground be better because there's less vibration through the ground oh, on absolutely. the grass? Absolutely. <clears throat> Although the grass can be. Uh, it's, it's well, the I find that grass grass is okay. Um, the only thing is because grass uh, has a tendency to settle. It right. takes a while for the scope to settle in. Yeah. Uh, because it is softer, especially in the summer. Yeah. So yeah. I found the deck a little better. <laughs> yeah. Peter's, Peter's nodding his head up and down. I think he knows uh, what we're talking about there. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, with my setup, I use uh, patio stones. I've got uh, three patio stones that I've got embedded in the ground. Yep. That uh, but you, you, could use a, you could use a smaller size patio stone, a little round one. Still, that, still gives you something. Yeah, because yeah, I have uh, some small patio stones. I actually one footers in there. That's a good idea. I might try that on the lawn, see if that'll work. Yeah, I've, I've got mine embedded so I can still cut the lawn. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> darn it, darn it, darn it, darn it. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to take the blade out with a patio stone, yeah. No, no. No, no, you don't want to do that, and, no, for sure. <laughs> and and Peter, actually, that's a good idea to sink them into the ground because we, we found like um, rubber patio stones and we set them not sunk into the ground and found that we tripped over them in the dark. Um, <laughs> the whole, that's not good for your scope when you actually trip over like the the rubberized patio stone that you've got like to keep your scope steady. Yeah. Glow in the dark paint would work well there too. Oh, wow. Yes, and and I, I, actually that's that's kind of what I said the first time I did it. I said, we need to like paint these like glow in the dark and then that goes, no, no, we'll be okay. And then I tripped over it like three seconds later, right? So I thought, yeah, okay, this is just not okay. working very good. Okay. Yeah, the, the patio stones that I use, they're, uh, they're sort of pie shaped. They're actually to fit around a, um, a fire pit. And oh, yes. you get about six of them will form a full circle. So I use three of them and you know, one for each leg of the tripod. But I, and I got a nice little circular one I put in the center. And when I arranged that all and sunk it into the ground, I realize it looks like a radiation symbol. <laughs> so I keep looking at Google Maps and zooming down on it and see if you can actually see this radiation symbol on my lawn. 
Okay. It, while they don't glow in the dark, you're fine. <laughs> I'll remember that. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. But if we, but there you go. Paint them, paint them with the glow in the dark paint, and then, uh, then you'll just have everybody uh, freaked out. A couple of, <laughs> couple of green laser pens at night through the sky, and you'll have your neighbors just to talking. <laughs> you know, okay. LEDs around okay, that. Folks. Thing, yeah. Okay, folks. Um, uh, I, I love the conversation. I wish it would have started about five minutes earlier. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, the family Whitman is not with us tonight. Uh, they had a previous engagement. So I have done the and the, where are we? I'm on screen. There I am. Um, draws for tonight. I have three items. One is from Firefly, which is the book on the sun. The Firefly, Firefly book, Observer's Guide to the Sun. Good little book. It's what I used when I first started studying the sun and it led me on to bigger and better things. Very, very good. Uh, second, I have a Firefly Planisphere. I, yeah, <laughs> I always have problems showing stuff here. Let me get rid of this background. That might help. There we go. Uh, the Firefly Planisphere. I think most of you are familiar with it. And the third item is one of John's books. He was just talking to us. 50 things to see with a small scope. So way it's going to work is I've already gone through the list of attendees tonight, and I've also done a random number generator. And I counted down the list, and the names are such. If, if you don't want the book, please let me know right away so that we can uh, get it off to somebody else. And here we go. Who's first on the list? It was Anne. Anne T. Catch. Are you still here, Anne? Anne? Yes, I am. There you are. Woohoo! Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> so I take that's a yes. You'll want a book or or whichever. You'll have yes. A choice. I would. I would love uh, John Reed's book. You got it. Hey, thank you. And for those of you, uh, I'll let you know that I will have another book next month from John Reed as well. So don't don't be too hurt that you didn't win this one. Okay, second on the list is Solange Medeiros. Are you here? Yes, yeah. yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so you have your choice now of the uh, Planisphere or the Sun Observer's book. Sorry, what's the second one? The Observer's book, the Observer's Guide to the Sun. Oh, that's quite interesting. I'll go for that one. <laughs> okay, that works. And last but not least, we have uh, Margaret Walton. Margaret, are you still here? Margaret. Yes, Bernie, she is. She's still here. Yeah. OK. OK, Margaret, uh, get in touch with me, chair at amateurastronomy.org. And we will make sure that you get your planisphere. In she she doesn't have she's here, but she doesn't have a mic. Yeah. Okay. Not a problem. Okay. So that takes care of those three things. Now we will move to. Was there anybody else that needed to speak before I, we have Matthew come on? I think that's it. Where'd my list go? I don't know. I lost my list. Whatever. Okay. Matthew. Yep. Oh, you're here. Good. I enjoyed speaking to you last night for the 10 minutes that took an hour and 45. <laughs> but that's always good when you get talking about astronomy and such. You yep. just keep going and going and going. Yeah, okay. that was a, a long talk. Yes, it was, but a productive one. I look forward to many more like that. Earlier in, day, earlier in the day. Okay, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you. I'll uh, skip right into sharing the screen. 
and I'll back out. And okay, go to here, hide floating controls. Nice. Okay, hey. yes, so you're up. I'm good. Um, so welcome to the Not Sky this month. I thought for change I would do something a bit different. And so what I'm going to talk about this month is a talk more directed at beginners to intermediates. Uh, and it's going to be about binocular observing and tying in doing the binocular observing with Stellarium and how to learn how to star hop to targets. Um, especially in the in town where you can't see too many stars using your binoculars and some of the settings in Stellarium that you might want to use to do it. And to start, um, I'm just gonna talk very quickly about binoculars for about five minutes and then we'll move on. Anyways, so binoculars are a fantastic uh, tool to use in astronomy. They're great for beginners and most of us who have been doing this quite a long time have multiple sets of binoculars, different sizes, and we still use them because sometimes you just want to lay back in a chair and look at the Milky Way, or you want to learn a new constellation and where some of the Messiers or some other objects are in there. And it's much easier to get a feel for the constellation, the star patterns in there and everything else if you use binoculars. Now, if you have larger binoculars like this pair here in this image, you pretty much have to use a tripod because um, they're so heavy that if you just look at the stars with, you know, handheld, stars are going to be bouncing around like ping pong balls off of the tennis table. So uh, you really do need to have a tripod. Smaller ones you can get away with just handheld very easily, but they still work better if they're mounted on a tripod. Now, if you really want to go whole hog, and there is something called a parallelogram mount, and that's this uh, item on the left. And this part here is the parallelogram with a counterweight, and you can put binoculars of just about any size on this big boy. It's, uh, it's, it's heavy duty. It's also very expensive. If you want one of these and you don't want to spend all that money, if you're handy, you can actually go online. There's um, plans for building them yourself with either wood or aluminum or whatever. and uh, you can actually, it's one of those projects that if you're handy, you can actually do quite a good job on it. On the right, you can see an older picture. It's not my stuff, but it gives you the idea, the range of sizes of binoculars that are still in use. And over here, this is probably a hundred millimeter objectives. The objectives are the lenses at the front end, probably an 80, a couple of 50 millimeter binoculars and a 35 by the looks of it there. So it's all different sizes. And of course, something like this on the left or the next one, you're pretty much gonna want to mount it on a tripod or a parallelogram. So these are actually my binoculars and one set in there is my wife's, but this is our binoculars. And I've gone from the smallest objective over here and they get bigger as you go across the uh, table until you get to the 100 millimeter ones over here. So all binoculars have three numbers that you need to know and especially, uh, one that's really important is going to be the field of view number down here. But first of all, you always have a number like this, 10 by 32, 8 by 42, 10 by 50, 15 by 70, 14 by 100. That's two different numbers, right? The first one is magnification and the second one is the size of the objective. So that's in millimeters. So that objective there is 32 millimeters. Way over here, this objective is 70 millimeters. Third number is field of view, which is basically how wide of uh, the area you're looking at, how wide can you see? The narrower the field of view, the narrower is the amount of stuff you can see from side to side. There are still some binoculars that insist on using this type of identification for field of view. 426 feet at 1,000 yards is an example, which is this pair right here. So much easier to think in degrees. And so you, you can convert it just by taking the feet divided by 52.5 like this, and you get 8.1 degrees. So these are actually the widest field binoculars on the table at 8.1 degrees. 
next ones are these small ones over here at six and a half. Generally, as you get bigger and bigger binoculars, the field of view smaller and smaller. From one by 50s and down that way, 50 millimeters and down, the fields of view and magnifications can be all over the place. So you have to find what works for you. And like most of us, you'll probably end up with a few pairs after a few years. So magnification should be pretty much self-explanatory, but just in case you haven't dealt with it too much, and this would be naked eye looking across the water and there's a little tiny sailboat there. And then with your binoculars, if there's seven magnification, it brings it seven times closer, eight times, eight times closer, and all the way over here, 15 times closer where obviously the boat is the majority of the image. Now remember, if you were trying to look at that with 15 power binoculars and they were ones, they're gonna be hard, to, that boat's gonna be bouncing around a lot. Field of view is uh, probably more something that less people know about if you're just beginning. You notice the magnification is the same all the way across the screen. And the only part of field of view I'm gonna talk about is from left to right, or the horizontal, I'm not gonna talk about the vertical. But just pretend that these binoculars only generate a narrower or wider field of view in the horizontal. So here, with a wide field, you've got lots of water before and after the boat. Medium field of view, you're starting to lose the water and a narrow field of view, uh, you've hard, hardly got anything other than the boat. And that might equate to like an eight degree field of view and a five and a three and a half or something here. I just made this up. It gives you the idea of what field of view is. Magnification is the same. As the field of view narrows, you can see less of the sky or harbor or whatever it is you're looking at. So those numbers I keep mentioning are always on binoculars. So on this, quite a few pairs have printed on the focus ring, which is you know um, right in the dead center of the binoculars. So seven by fifty and six point two degrees on this pair. So seven magnification, fifty millimeter objectives, six point two degree field of view, which would be pretty pretty standard. Six and a half is probably you know pretty normal. These are the pair that are the really wide field, 8.1 degree ones, and you can see it's eight by 42, and the field of view is 426 feet. I've always hated that because it never means much to me uh, compared to degrees. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna shut down the PowerPoint. I'm gonna bring up Stellarium. Stellarium is a planetarium piece of software. It's free, it's excellent. It runs all types of platforms. I use the one on my uh, PC, my laptop all the time. Uh, if you haven't have it already, you can get it from stellarium.org. Now this is important. There's, if you get it from other places, it could have viruses in it. If you get it from stellarium.org, it is clean. And the newest version is 21.3 and you can get it right off the website. So here we go. We're gonna figure out how to incorporate the two things together. All right. Here's the version number up here, 21.3, just in the top left corner of that box. So when Stellarium comes up, it comes up to now, whatever the time and date is now. Um, I'm gonna just get rid of this again because it's right in the way, if I can. Hide. There we go. All right. So first thing you want to do is know that down the left side, there are some icons and they come up. And at the bottom, there's another set of icons along here. The icons on the side are to set things in the program, options, controls, stuff like that, and things like location, time. And you've got a search box and you've got a toolbox there for configuration. At the bottom, all of these things here are things that you change that actually change what you see on the screen immediately. So you can add or subtract things from the screen. So the first thing I'm going to do is set a time and date. And I can pretend it's like the 18th of the month. You just click on that. And then I'm going to go back an hour, maybe to 9.15 or so. 
on the screen, you're going to have the sky. Uh, you can specify whether or not you have your compass marks show up. You can specify whether you have the ecliptic. Uh, and I also like to have the meridian, which is your line due south, due north. And I like this because this gives you an, an idea of when items are coming up from the east, they reach their highest point at the meridian in the south if they're in the southern sky, and then they start to set over here. It's kind of handy to know where that is with a line. It just helps. And of course, you clip is that yellow line there, which is the line that the planets move along. And it's also the general line that, that runs through all those constellations of the zodiac. Zoom in and out, you can use your mouse and you can just go in and out like that. Very nice because they get into a lot of detail. Now, what you can see on the screen is a lot of stars that are dim. You're not gonna see those ones in the city, these little dudes. And you're not going to see any deep sky objects for the most part in the city. So the first thing I'm going to do is get rid of the deep sky object. And luckily they made it easy. They used a galaxy for that. You click on it and all of those things go away. And then I'm going to set the limit, visual limit for the stars I can see. I'm going to set it to magnitude 3.5, which is pretty reasonable probably for in a, a good sized town. So this is one of the, this is the um, options, one that comes up and it's got tabs across the top, sky in general, solar system, deep sky markings on the screen, such as the meridian line or the ecliptic. But what I'm gonna do is just concentrate on this little part right here. First of all, if you don't see any stars, click on that box, because you do need some stars. And down here, there's a box here that is limit magnitude. So if you click on that, then you can adjust this box. Right now, the limiting magnitude is five. I'm gonna take it down to 3.5. And what you'll notice is, is that a good number of the stars are gone. Well, this is more like the stars you would see in the city. And of course, you're not gonna see these blue lines, but they do show you that there should be a star there. There should be one there. You know, there should be one there and there. It's just too dim to show up in the city. You're only going to get the ones you can see. And just to give you an even better idea, down here you've got the names of the constellations and you've got the lines. You can get rid of those. And now, basically, other than the meridian line and the ecliptic, you would see things as they are in the sky, including Orion over there and Canis Major there. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing I want to do is add a circle that will appear on the screen that's gonna simulate a field of view of your binoculars. Now, there's several ways to do this, but this is the one I'm gonna show you. You go back into this little box here and you go to markings. And this looks really, really complicated. It's not. This has got cardinal points, which are your north, south, east, west. This is where you tick off the ecliptic and the meridian and the zenith. And if you come down here, one called circular field of view, you click on that. I'm gonna pretend that our binoculars have a seven degree field of view, okay? So that's the field of view of the binoculars we're gonna pretend use. So I take this up to seven, click outside the box and presto, I've got a blue ring on the sky and that was the field of view of your binoculars. So I can use the mouse to drag the sky around and put that circle wherever I want. So I'm gonna put it on the belt of Orion. I can use the wheel on the mouse, to zoom in. And there you go. You can see with a seven degree field of view, you easily get the belt in. And in fact, you could also get your, most of the Orion Nebula in there as well. So these are nice wide field binoculars. So next, what you really want to do is you've got your sky figured out. You know what your dimmest stars are. You can see naked eye. You've got your binocular field of view set up. Now there's things called plugins and you need two of them to do this properly. Again, this sounds like, oh my goodness, it's a lot of work. It's not, it's pretty straightforward. So down here, I'm gonna show you the one that's already in. This is called the plugin, it's for drawing angles. So I can, 
click on Procyon and hold the left mouse button down and I can drag it across. And I know now that Beetlejuice is 26 degrees from Procyon. This is handy because if your binocular field is seven, then you know how many times you have to move your binoculars over to get from one star to the other. Another thing that the, this does is it gives you nice straight lines, which you can use to draw imaginary lines in the sky. The thing that's a pain about this, and I get caught all the time, is after I do that, I forget to click it off, and nothing works until you do that. So that is a little thing that will catch you over and over. So where do you, how do you get to the plugins? Well, you go down to the configuration window, and you've got some tabs. Only one on this page you would care about is save settings, and that's when you've got everything just the way you like it before you exit the program. If you click on save settings, the next time it comes up, pretty much everything that you did in terms of setting up, configuring it, will still be there. The last tab is plugin. You tap on it, and over on the left is a list of a 20 or so plugins. Notice the second one is that angle measurement. That's that little angle symbol down here. You don't have to do anything with this except click on the little box that says load at startup. All right, so the next time you go into the program out of your main screen and windows, it'll be loaded. It'll be on your taskbar at the bottom. So that's the one. And now here's another one called oculars. And oculars, is, um, hang on, I'm just gonna move that. Oculars is where you can actually enter uh, your own eyepieces, your own telescopes, and you can say one type of eyepiece and one type of telescope, and it will come up and show you the field of view on the screen, it's really cool. Or you can enter some binoculars as well. Again, you do load it, start up. But for oculars, you're gonna to wanna to go into the configure box. Again, it looks difficult, it's not. And this whole box here, all you need is on-screen control panel click. And that's this one over here. That's oculars, sensors, as in cameras, that's your tell rad, and that's making changes that brings this up again. We don't care about sensors, we don't care anything about that. And in the ocular view, the one thing that's really important is use semi-transparent mask. You want to click on that and set it to about 30%. What happens is that when you go into binocular mode, you're going to see a nice big circle on the screen, which will show you what's in the field of your binoculars, but all around it's going to be black. So you can't see what stars or other objects are just out of the field of view. So you want to make it transparent so that outside the field of view, you can see what's going on. Down here, just for your information, is your TELRAD. So what you can do is if you want, if you've got some other device or you just want to cheat and do other fields of view, you can change these on the TELRAD. You know, you could have five degrees, six and a half, eight, whatever, two, three, it doesn't matter. You can have like a bullseye of different fields of view that are particular to what you want, you can put them in. And whenever you click on the Telrad button up in the top right corner, your fields of view that you like will come up. So that's another way to get circles on your screen to show what you'll be able to see. The next tab is the only one other one I'm going to talk about, eyepieces. Now this is weird because they don't have a uh, tab in here for binoculars. They went and they put their binoculars in the same Screen as their eyepieces. So the first bunch are all eyepieces, and then after that, they entered some very nice, high quality binoculars in there. The last one, the Kawa 10 by 50s, five degrees, that's one I've entered. And I'm just going to show you how to add your own. It's not difficult. So you go down the bottom and you add a new set of binoculars. Click this little box on binoculars or it won't work. I found that out. Give it a name. So you might say it's uh, 10 by 50, 7 degree field of view. 
All right, so I put all the numbers you need are right there. So the field of view, click in there and put seven for degree, seven degrees. Magnification, click in there and type in 10. And the diameter of your objectives in this case is 50. So now you don't have to hit save. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's in. So if I go to the next one in the list up, my powers, and then come back down, the information's there. So that's how you enter your own binoculars into this. And it's a very similar way of doing the eyepieces or doing telescopes. It's uh, something you can play with. Remember, you can't really wreck this program. Uh, if everything starts going weird and you're sort of mixed up, if you exit out and you haven't saved your settings, you're just back where you started. You can go back in and try again. So I'm going to exit out of that. <clears throat> so I've done that. And so here again in the center, oops, got one more there. Sorry, here in the center again, you've got this field of view that I created. And I use this because once you go into the binocular field of view, you can't move the screen around, which is not very useful. You can look at what you're looking at right now, but that's it. So if I click on the ocular view, you can see what it says here. It's my Kawa 10 by 50s with a five degree field of view. The blue ring is the seven degrees we already did. And the red ring is around what you'd see with the binoculars. You notice that the five degree is a much tighter view with the stars closer to the edges here. Now, there's one other thing. When you use binoculars or telescope, you can see dimmer stars. And typically, I would say in town, if you're naked eye, you can see magnitude 3.5. You should be able to go to 6 to 7.5 in that range. So you can go back into your viewing port here, back to sky, and you can go to your limit magnitude and you can bump it. And somehow it seems to know that this is different than your regular view and it tracks both of these numbers. So I just changed it to 7.5. And now magically in your field of view is that nice snake that runs through the belt of Orion. You've got many more stars. If I say, I don't want to look at the binoculars anymore, you come up to the corner, click on it again, and you're back to your naked eye view where it's magnitude 3.5, very few stars to see. So that's basically how you enter your binoculars, you figure out your field of view, what, what can I see when I you know stare at one particular piece of sky, and it's going to help you in a minute. So what we're going to do is throw the deep sky objects back in because you know that's the things you're going to want to look at not just stars so that's the little galaxy one down in the bottom here you just click on it and like magic all these things come back in most of these are messiers and uh, colander objects and caldwell things like that so how do we use what we've just done i'm going to put the lines back in because well it's a lot easier to see what's going on so right here is M67, open cluster. It's a pretty little one. But one thing you'll notice is, is that there's hardly any bright stars in this whole piece of sky. And it's a fairly large piece of sky. None of the stars in Cancer are visible in the city. Even in Brantford here at the edge of town, I never see them. It's just gotta use binoculars to ha even have a hope. So how are you going to find this little tiny cluster that's only like three quarters of a degree across in your binoculars if you've got not, no guideposts? Well, this is where the angle plugin comes in really handy. So down at the bottom, there's the angle plugin. You click on it. What you can do is start drawing imaginary lines in the sky, trying to find a line that intersects with your target. So if I start at Regulus, which is a very bright star and go across the Procyon, which is another really bright star, you can see the line is a fair distance from M67. So if you wanna be a bit closer, you say, okay, I can see Algeba here at the neck of the, uh, the lion. And again, I'll go through to Procyon. And this is much closer. That means when I run the binoculars along this imaginary line in the sky, 
I'm going to run right into it if, as long as I follow that line with the binoculars. So the thing is, is that you may not know exactly where in that line it is. And again, the angle tool is what's going to save you because I can click on M67 and make the old line go away, back to Canis Minor, and Sometimes you have to move the cursor around a bit to see what's going on, but basically that's 18.7 degrees, let's call it 19 degrees. So M67 is 19 degrees from Scion. Your field of view is only seven. So three times seven is 21. That means you're gonna to have to go three binocular fields to get to 67. That's about the difficulty of the math we're looking at. So you would pick up your binoculars and I'm gonna blow this up a bit so it's a bit easier. And whoops, yeah, I did it. You gotta get rid of that at the bottom. Okay, now I can move things around. And you find Procyon in your binoculars there. You got it, you're good. Now you're gonna start moving on that imaginary line that goes to Algeba way over here, same line M67 is on. So the way to do it, and it's always pretty much the same way is look in your binoculars and you're going to look for little stars that are close to the edge of the field of view here in the same direction as your target and then what you're going to do is you're going to move the binoculars so that those things that you just looked at are at the other side and then you're going to look for a little star over here and you're going to move it so i've moved two fields three fields and then you're going to move it one more time. And there you go. It should be right there. So generally speaking, um, this is how you move around in the sky, especially when you have a lack of markers, is you've got to draw imaginary lines, know how much of the sky you can see with your binoculars, and then count fields of view across. And this is why the angle uh, in here is extremely useful. So I'll do one more in a different orientation, but it's basically the same. M3, fabulous globular, uh, really beautiful. Again, in that part of the sky, I find in Brantford here, this from here to here is huge. And it's almost nothing that I can see naked eye that allows me to find M3. But I can use my angle plug in here. You can see Cor Coroli. And you can see our tourists. And when you happen to do that, it's beautiful. It works right out, works right on like that. It's right on the line. You now know that if you can draw an imaginary line in the sky um, from Cor Coroli to our tourists, the M3 is along that line. So, same idea. I'm going to turn off the angle thing. I'm going to drag, you're going to put your binoculars in the center, our tourists. Remember which way you're going, and you're going to drag Arcturus to the opposite end so that you're pointing up this way. You're going to find a really dim star here, and you're going to pull it down. And look at M3 is in the corner of your field of view. If you don't have good peripheral vision, then maybe you just think, okay, it's right at the very edge. I'm going to just move it a bit more, and you'll have it. This is really quite simple once you get used to the idea of drawing the lines in Stellarium or on your charts or however you do it. And then with a ruler, just put it down and you know between the lines on your chart, uh, between the stars, sorry, the line there. And once you do that and you know how much field of view you've got, you can actually just sort of wander back and forth on these lines looking for your target. Knowing how many fields you have to move is really very helpful and it should help you a lot in uh, learning how to star hop around the sky is to start by star hopping with binoculars. And that's the end, I'm done. Did I just kick out? Well, that was an abrupt end, but it was... <laughs> yeah, I don't know where I went. I, am I still... Yeah, you're still on. Okay. There we go. There you go. There we go. Anyways, that is the end because uh, I knew I've already gone about half an hour or so. But that I think hopefully that gets a general idea that you can learn to use Stellarium over time.
and you can learn to integrate it with your observing, uh, to use it as an observing tool. I think while we're talking about Stellarium, and there are a lot of people that are just going to be starting to use it now because of that, you might want to remind them about that other setting for Jupiter. Yes, there is another setting in Stellarium that will really mess you up. If you're doing some uh, observing of the moons of Jupiter, for instance, and you know that one of them has gone behind Jupiter and it's supposed to pop out at a certain time of the evening, if you don't have this particular setting in Stellarium, you will be off by the number of minutes that it takes the light to come from Jupiter to Earth. And it's quite aggravating when something doesn't pop out when it's supposed to. So there is a setting in Stellarium that says uh, basically to uh, account for light speed. And that way um, it will appear on your screen at the same time it appears in the sky. Yep. And it's a very handy piece of information. And I remember uh, when I first joined this club, I learned about Stellarium. I hadn't heard of it before. And I was, I was using it. And exactly as you said, I was predicting the, uh, the uh, phenomenon on uh, the Galilean moons and I could never hit it right. And then one, uh, one week after that, uh, you happen to be presenting uh, something down at, uh, 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 at the spectator and you mentioned about the uh, light speed and click, everything worked well since then. That was quite annoying until I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't figure out how it could be so consistently wrong. Yeah, 19 minutes or something stupid like that. I, I can't remember what it is, but it, yes, it was the same all the time. Anyway, thank you so very much. Does anybody have a question for, for Matthew before, we, uh, before I go into our next section here? I know a lot of people are saying thank you for just demonstrating this so clearly. Uh, software is excellent, thanks. Uh, great demo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the good stuff. Kudos to you again, Matthew. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us close to the end of this particular meeting. I would like to thank our guest speaker, John Reed. Please be sure to uh, check his books out at Amazon. And just type him in as, as the author and you'll get his whole listing of books. Sue, for her uh, information about the Skelton uh, site. And Dave Skelton for dropping in and joining us and filling us in on that. Uh, Joanne for her bit of information about the contest for the kids. I, I really hope we get some activity there would be great. To Chris Stretch for his work with the uh, Facebook. I hope that's all going well. And let's see, uh, Sue again for being our moderator. Matthew for doing his thing. And let's see, who else? What else? Oh, yes. And I can't remember who's responsible for this nonsense, but please, people, do not forget to set your clocks ahead this weekend. It's that time of year again. Myself, I set mine tonight. That way by Monday morning, I've already adjusted my time. Just means I have two days of going through the day ahead of myself. <laughs> I won't be late for a change. Thank you, folks. Oh, yes, I forgot to thank you. And you and yours for joining us. And I hope to see you again next month on the first Friday. And that brings us on where are we? The 8th of April, our speakers, we have a special event. Uh, it's going to be a moon month. So if you have any interest in the moon, this is the month you want to be here. We'll be having uh, Larry McHenry speak to us about beginners observing the moon. We'll have Erica Ricks from uh, uh, formerly of the Sky and Telescope. Uh, doing a, a presentation on uh, uh, sketching, possibly sketching on the moon. I, and I will be releasing the uh, uh, Hamilton Amateur Astronomers Moon Observing Program on that occasion. I don't know what Matthew has in mind. I, I, you never know with Matthew, which is always a good surprise. <laughs> I never know. 
I know. That, <laughs> that's that's what the surprise is. Anyway, thank you, folks. I was going to say again. I was going to say drive safe. Okay. Well, anyway, drive safe and play fair. If you're going out, it's a little slick out there. Be careful, please. I'd like to see you back next month. Good night, everybody.